Okay, Tony, you can go ahead. Okay, if you give me a second here, just a second. Okay, so are we on now? Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm talking to what? A bunch of people? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Well, um, everybody, this is uh, incredibly special after everything that we've all been going through for the last eight months of or so, where I didn't even expect to be uh, having a lecture series or welcoming such an amazing and wonderful artist like Helena Metaferia. So with that being said, I wanna welcome her, introduce her to you. And uh, I'll start with Helena Metaferia. She completed her MFA at Tufts University of School, uh, University's School of the Museum of Fine Arts and attended the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture. She has exhibited her work nationally and internationally, including at Museum of African Diaspora in San Francisco, Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, Smack Mellon in New York, Modern Art Museum Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and she's currently a Mellow Fellow Assistant Professor at Brown University and lives and works in New York City. Uh, Helena also had the pleasure to, for her to be my colleague, our colleague. She was an ACAD Fellow and spent, uh, I think, two years at the Art Institute, uh, teaching graduate at the Nijanras Department. Incredible. I even had to uh, take over her class once for a couple of weeks, and that was a incredible experience. It was at a time when I think there wasn't too much uh, conversations around performance. And uh, so I really miss having Helena around because it was in an incredible cornerstone of the program and the department. Uh, Helena is an interdisciplinary, has an interdisciplinary practice that includes performance, video, mixed media, collage, installation, and sculptural assemblage. Her work investigates the relationship between the body and the politics of space, particularly as it relates to notions of identity and citizenship. Through a hybrid of mediums, she mines materials, archives, and artifacts for their suggested histories and creates new meaning by activating them through embodied gestures. As an Ethiopian American, Helena's practice draws upon both African and Western art histories. It is, again, can't say it enough, an amazing pleasure to have this awesome artist. Welcome and thank you so much, Helena, for your time. Helena Metaferia. Thank you so much, Tony. I really appreciate that warm introduction and so good to see everyone virtually in these crazy times. Um, I was definitely um, excited when Tony asked me to do this because um, you know SFAI has a special place in my heart. It was my first place I um, was teaching right after um, graduate school. So I learned a lot um, in that environment and the new genres department is very special to me. Um, so I wanna take a little bit of time to talk about my practice and um, also, to have a great conversation with Tony regarding um, the work. And so I'll spend the first part of the talk really just focusing in on my work and um, how I've also pivoted for this time, um, which I think a lot of students um, probably would like to hear about how artists are pivoting um, in all of 2020, everything that 2020 has to offer. I'm gonna share my screen. So let's see. Could, uh, Zaina, could you give me a thumbs up if you can see this? Okay, great. I'm gonna go full screen. Okay. So again, my name is Helena Metaferia. I work in a um, variety of genre, um, variety of mediums. And I really just use the medium that I think best reflects what I wanna say conceptually. 
And so I really was able to open up my practice in that way. Um, it was coming out of a school of painting and um, in graduate school, I really opened it up to interdisciplinary mediums because I knew that with um, the interest that I had in the body and body-based practices, I could use my own body in performance. I could use that documentation and those relics and make artistic objects out of them. And that just really began to inform my practice, like being able to use performance and performing relics in many different types of ways. So I'll go over about five projects um, briefly, just an overview of works that I've done. Um, I'm actually gonna pay a little bit of attention to time to make sure that it's all within a good time. Um, so uh, I do work in performance and um, I'll show you some work starting from about 2014, 2015 until present. Um, in my performance work, one thing I've started to think about in, in making was um, this idea of a Dinkra idea called Sankofa. It's a Ghana uh, Sankofa is a Ghanaian um, proverb, which means you must uh, go back to get in order to move forward. And so I was thinking about that relating to ancestry. So a lot of my work in this particular um, series has to do with this notion of ancestry. So I'll play something for you, that, a performance that I did um, just like maybe a couple months ago. Um, this was on the centennial of a uh, woman's right to vote in this country. And I made a performance for black women suffragettes. Um, in, this was a performance at Grand Army Plaza, socially distanced, um, and it was in conjunction with the Wide Awakes Movement, which is an arts collective um, founded by um, Hank Willis Thomas and Jose Parla and um, Eric Gottsman, different um, contemporary artists, all around the idea of um, citizen citizenship and notions of um, agency and social change in this, in this incredible time that we're in.
So this performance, um, I think the structure of it was calling forth uh, four Black women um, suffragettes from uh, who were active in the late, um, the early 1900s, late 1800s, and who, and is part of the reason that I, a Black woman, could vote in this country today. Um, learning and knowing that uh, Black women gained the right to vote way after white women did, and um, the many struggles that it took for uh, this thing that so many of us may take for granted today, right? This, um, this civic duty, the civic duty that could be civic joy, that could be civic um, responsibility, um, but, it, but it's kind of honoring them and all that it takes for uh, us to make those strides um, and to make change. And so it's completely relative to this incredible week we have amongst us, <laughs> ahead of us. Um, so that structure, a lot of my structures tend to evolve over time. And that the one of the first um, sort of ways in which I approached this ancestral honoring series was by looking at my own ancestry, actually creating this wearable sculpture made out of family photographs and archives um, that um, I was able to collect um, with my mother, who um, she helped me build this sort of these, these archives. And um, I, I made this during um, when I was a graduate student, my thesis here, and then I performed it at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Same thing with a liquid, um, making footprints on canvas, um, making these different gestures. And I love the accountability of doing something in front of the public. Like there was this like thing that you could do it private. You can make these rituals very personal and, and intimate and private to you or just for the camera. But there's something about people holding space and holding you accountable for your actions, wanting to see it through. And so again, my background is in painting. So instead of painting on canvas now, now I use my entire body to make marks, to make gestures. Um, and, I, and I still work and sometimes on canvas, um, but much in a much more different way um, where I'm really interested in residue and how that um, can be pr preserved and building archives, finding archives and building archives. I'm also interested in the living archive of the human body and all of the stories that this archive, this physicality that we have holds. So uh, as I said before, my mother helped me to build that, um, that, that, that recall the memory of my ancestors. And a year later she passed away. And um, when Tony alluded that he you know, took over a class for me, it was during that time when I was at SFAI, teaching at SFAI. And so I made this memorial for her. And so instead of thinking about embodying all of the different ancestors who helped me to become an Ethiopian American, I thought about her one specific story. And I began to um, unearth some of her um, stories that she uh, was writing in a memoir about her activism work um, because she was a expat living in the US from Ethiopia, but a very prominent um, women's rights activist, Ethiopian women's rights activist. And so I was pulling forth those archives and sort of calling forth her being. And that was a very emotional performance for me, obviously very private uh, and personal rather. And then to hold that in public space, this was performed at Five Miles Gallery in Brooklyn in 2016. To hold that in public space was um, very vulnerable. And that vulnerability I think is super important in an artist's work. Um, my work is both personal and political, but I think that it's always very honest. And that authenticity gets um, communicated and that gives people permission to become vulnerable with me. So like, for example, with this performance, people came up to me afterwards and said that parts of it resonated for them, whether it was, was parts about grief and the own grieving that they were going through or um, this idea of memory and um, remember how, what it is to remember someone and how we choose to remember people through photograph, through text, through stories, experiences. Um, also part of the same series, I was building a um, wearable sculpture of maps of Washington DC, Nadia Sabah, Ethiopia, the place I was born and the place where my family's from and wove those together and then created um, a performance with an avatar that I evoked. I evoked the stories of 40 Ethiopian Americans that I gathered from interviews across DC and Addis Ababa and um, made this installation and video installation, but also actively performed it at time and performed it at times. And to me, this was uh, another version of calling forth of ancestry um, at the uh, Smithsonian Port National Portrait Gallery, um, reciting the naturalization oath to become a US citizen um, in front of George Washington's portraits and thinking of what it means to be 
consider three fifths of a human being in that time and how one renounces their African heritage or, you know, in order to become an American. And so what is that choice of um, voluntary migration as opposed to uh, the involuntary and brutal migration of the transatlantic slave trade, but also in this way, it is, um, you know, thinking about the irony, but also paying forward, paying tribute to all those that it made it possible for me to volunteer uh, to come to this country or for my parents rather to come to this country and immigrate um, under the conditions that we have today. And so uh, my story is very much an American story um, and it is one of many versions of being an American. Um, and so this is another image from that particular performance. Some influences of my work, uh, it's particularly in my performance work, is my past professor, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, an Afro-Cuban uh, artist um, who was my mentor. She still is a, a close mentor of mine. And uh, my very first performance with her was at the Guggenheim Museum for the Carrie Mae Weems retrospective, where we activated that space. Um, Carrie Mae Weems being the first Black artist to have a retrospective, retrospective at the Guggenheim. And so this was in 2014. And um, I think what I take away, my takeaways from that experience and from um, learning in that very much apprenticeship way was that when you have a platform, you break down the walls and you try to open and get as many people in as possible, whether that's your students or whether that is um, you know, other artists that you invite. And so that's what Carrie Mae Weems did for Magda and that's what Magda did for me. Um, Marilyn Arsom was also a professor of mine at the museum school, who is uh, the founder of the performance department there. And she does this durational work. And that was really informative for me thinking about time and the body in a way that isn't the go, go, go time that we're used to. It's not TV time or entertainment time. It can be slow, it can be intentional, it can be meditative. Um, so another project that I was doing, and this is a project while I was at the Bay Area, was this project called Home Free at the Museum of African Diaspora. And I'll just show you. These are just glimpses of projects. Um, and that's what we've been asking about. Get us into the that um, had only one leg. about the area and I lived there I experienced a lot of disability um so in the central film I'm doing a performance with a performance artist in different cities that I had lived and worked in Washington DC in Oakland California in New York New York in Harlem. And each of these uh, experiences were in front of spaces that were, um, I'm going to admit somebody in. I don't know if I can do that. Sorry, somebody's asking to come in. Um, yes, so uh, each one of these uh, experiences, or each one of these places were places that were becoming developed and gentrified. So for example, in Washington, DC, um, here is a mom and pop shop that um, I uh, sort of grew up going to an Ethiopian restaurant that was closed and um, after 25 years of service. And so making a gesture, making a gesture was almost a gesture of protest and resistance, but it's also a gesture of mourning, right? And so there's these processions that um, I continue to do. Um, this was during the ghost ship fires in 20, I think it was 2016. I happened to be filming that week and with artists Aida Aliyah Rashid, we did a memorial with the community um, in front of the ghost ship fire. And, um, you know, there's a sensitivity that I have to artists run spaces that are, you know, people are squatting or living in these kind of um, unseeable conditions. And um, to do that with the community in, in my, the home that I had of a moment, for me felt um, a way to sort of memorate individual lives, but also draw attention to you know, housing, housing crisis and those kinds of issues. So a lot of my work has to do with um, belonging, essentially. Um, I'll just show a quick clip of a video. Thinking about mapping 
mapping the unknown and seeing precariousness, which is also very relevant to 2020. What does it mean to map the unknown? And here, doing a similar gesture with um, trying to throw what I call divinations. So instead of throwing stick and um, throwing everything that have been used and repurposed in. Uh, for home in the from the Bay Area. And then taking that ephemera and those videos and then installing them um, at the Museum of African Diaspora where I had a solo show in 2017. Um, thinking about the artifacts of the photo and not just the video, making these conceptual photographs um, based on the same housing, housing materials. Um, and then a lot of this was informed by Ethiopian aesthetics as well. Um, thinking about the aesthetics that also I feel familiar with and therefore echo a sense of home to me. Um, a lot of my art is influenced by Ethiopian artworks where, which aren't very precious. They are ritualistic. They are um, oftentimes talisman. And this is an example of something like that. So instead of, um, so in this case, I'm using door parts, uh, ephemera from Oakland and San Francisco to make a talisman symbol, um, an amulet me suffocating myself in a map of Oakland. Um, that was what it was like to find housing in the area. And then lastly, a performance with some of my SFAI students when I was teaching at the time. I'm filled with love to the brim, and I don't let that go. So you can build your walls or your bands, try to create more borders on top of borders, it's not enough. You just fueled me with some ammunition, you fueled us with ammunition to fight and to love harder. Love is babies. Love is. Love is sweet. Activating the work even further by doing one live performance during the whole set. I was influenced by Mark Rothko's work during this time. I was obsessed with the color red and I found this paint at Benjamin Moore called Heritage Red. And I thought it was amazing because I was like, how can you bottle and commodify heritage? And so I became very obsessed with it, but I was also at the same time looking at Mark Rothko's Seagram murals. I was looking at Betty Sars Red Time exhibition. And um, thinking about her assemblages, how they're both quote unquote spiritual, but also political. And, um, and in response to um, how she sees the world and, and her environment. I was also influenced by Ethiopian textiles. Again, some of that line work that um, with the wooden flooring, those photographs were very much thinking about that patterning in, in the textile work. Um, so Refiguring the Canon is a show that um, is actually traveling now. It's called Against the Sharp White Background. It was just at Northeastern University and um, 
it's a different body of work. Um, and now it's heading to Auburn University's um, gallery in Alabama. So um, this work I've been developing for about two years. Um, again, I'm interested in archives. I'm interested in this idea of belonging. I'm interested in history and embodiment. So with the um, material that I was able to stumble upon and find at a residency at Bemis, I found this, these like boxes of, you know, any material you want, they have a whole floor of it. And I found these boxes of um, art news, art forum, textbooks from all these different decades. And I was really obsessed with the 1980s, particularly because I'm an 80s baby. And I was thinking about who was making at that time, like who are the makers and the thinkers you know, who were celebrated, you know, these are the legitimizing like sort of ephemera. And of course, very little representation of people of color, if any, very few women, but there was this interest in the primitive, right? Um, MoMA had just done this ret retrospective or this, this big show called The Modern and the Primitive um, of like the Picasso generation with like these unknown, unnamed, genderless artists, black artists, indigenous artists, right? These are the influencers of modern art history. And I really thought that um, it was quite interesting and in how, you know, that generation really wanted to um, bring in, make sense of um, primitive, quote unquote, tribal work by bringing in their sort of Western philosophy and placing that as central, right? And so the white man's work is of course worth a lot more. It's um, way more esteemed, it's archived as true art. Whereas the novelties of the primitive artists were sort of like, um, I mean, it was almost as if it, it was, there was humor in, in the fact that it was being, um, uh, taken seriously by these esteemed artists. So, you know, I had a lot to say about that. <laughs> and how do I say a lot? How do I talk about it? I talk about it through my work. So I decided to perform on paper. I cut up old performance stills and I centralized my figure um, and collaged with uh, the art that was in those 1980s magazines. So here you have like a set of Van Goghs, for example, on my, on my head. And then, um, you know, I wanted to pretend or perform to be the um, unknown gendered, ungendered um, African artist who has become appropriated. And so I centralize my form and my body and miniaturize the work of um, these uh, white male artists, mostly um, some women too. Um, and then I sort of interrupt that canon, so to speak. Um, with my own invented mythology or um, history. Basically understanding that history is very subjective and here are the actual articles from um, the Tribal and the Modern exhibition. Um, you know, but it is how we, how we interpret and how we archive and what we choose to emphasize. And so um, bringing in Ethiopian American or Ethiopian art history motifs such as eyes, eyes are very prominent in Ethiopian painting work, which is a very old tradition um, you know, in, inserting myself and my eyes becomes like a side eye as in sh throwing shade. It also is a reference to an appropriated history. Um, and so this series has also taken the form of collaging in time and space. So during residencies or interventions at museums. So at Mass Mocha, I had a residency and I did these interventions in front of Saul Witt's work. Um, I tried to collage in time and space with the camera as a witness and making these sort of compositions with my body. Um, at the National Gallery of Art, which is a federally run museum in DC, using my body and, and juxtaposing it against um, these Barnett Newman paintings and thinking about how I can do the most simplest gesture to shift the meaning of their work and again, to centralize it around my form, thinking about, you know, these are artists who wanted to not emphasize the figure, right? The figure, again, in the sort of um, philo the philosophy of that time, um, you know, you needed to evolve beyond that form and to focus on higher thought, whatever that means. Um, I've been like spending a lot more time listening to like Western philosophy being interpreted and it's quite, it's quite interesting to me, but the, the primitive is usually worth thinking about the figure, thinking about things that are grounding, like drumming or earth, earth sort of um, works. And so, you know, if I bring in my body, does it then, and my identity 
as a political um, sort of intervention, does it then shift the meaning or bring our attention towards the white male form, which is supposed to be obscured or, or not important within the placement of the work? So here is um, a little clip of me performing live. Um, this was not an invited performance of the um, This was at the National Ballet Row. And this is in front of the Money Row. And so I really need to about a couple minutes. And I wanted to see what the, oh, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. And I wanted to see what the reaction was going to be. And most people would know that. Although some people did sit and watch, some people just, just walked by over my phone, and I was willing to take the video. Um, didn't even notice me. So this video makes a lot of people either angry <laughs> or they find that it, it evokes something, right? Whether it's good or bad. And I think that's kind of the point. Like art shouldn't necessarily tell you what to do or how to think, but it should give you something to feel compelled to have any sort of reaction. Uh, at the end, I really wanted to get my format, my physicality, and assert my being within that space. You know, myself as a black woman, as a black and emerging artist who's born in DC, as well as gallery is, um, knowing that there's a, quite a division between the two institutions and the gallery one institution of Congress and the select. Um, and also to the place, they rarely replace a black woman who's born in DC in that institution. <laughs> so, uh, uh, in terms of criminal conduct, maybe as a invited by the performance. So, um, anyway, em emphasis or inspiration for this work is again Ethiopian uh, manuscripts, Ethiopian healing scrolls, um, my own art history, finding ways to incorporate the eyes or certain motifs that maybe somebody else wouldn't recognize, but they're they're in there for me. Haradina Pendel's work. Um, she is a painter who, I mean, I started off painting and she went into performance and video to critique not just the canon, but also institutions and institutional politics because of the severe racism she experienced when she was a curator at MoMA. And um, I, I just love her work and I love the audacity she brings into that um, video, Free White and 21. Hannah Hawke's work, who um, in the 1930s, uh, was making the sort of institutional critique work in the Dada's movement. Um, her ethnographic museum series specifically focused on these ideas of notions of the primitive within modern art histories. Okay, so I have a couple more things to share and then we can have we can have a conversation. Um, this one is actually quite relevant to this moment that we're in now. And I began it, I would say 2018, 2019. Um, by way of revolution, this is a, a billboard that's currently up in the Bronx. Um, it's part of alternative ways of making and being in this time. <laughs> so um, with all the postponements of gallery and museum shows, there comes public art. Um, so this particular series is something that I started at a residency at Michigan State University in 2018. Um, they actually have, and again, I love archives and ideas of um, archives around specifically, specifically about black history. And so they have a huge uh, archive of um, what they call radical art or radicalism. And so I was really interested in like the Black Panther newspapers. I was interested in um, the anti-apartheid movement posters. And in that radicalism collection, they collect everything from KKK material, which is more of course right wing um, or or towards the right. And then they collect like things like Ethiopian travel posters, which someone thought that was very radical to even be an Ethiopian or to go to Ethiopia. So I really am always critiquing the archive themselves and like how they get made. Um, and then I created these, um, these uh, collages, um, not with my form, but with the form of um, participants for workshops that I host. So I, I've been, for the last couple of years, I've been doing these workshops traveling around the country being invited by institutions and um, organizations to do these private workshops that are not documented in the traditional sense with um, those who identify as BIPOC women um, 
And uh, these workshops are about resiliency. It's about how to take up space and how to assert oneself in institutions that were not ultimately designed for us. Again, most of these institutions you know, with the histories that we have of white systemic oppression, um, they were designed for white men. And so how do we make space for ourselves and knowing that we're constantly doing double work or triple work to exist within these spaces? Um, and so I don't photograph those private performances workshops. Um, we think about resiliency in the body and we move our bodies in a way that echo protest histories. But I do document the participants who volunteer to be documented. So these are portraits of some of the people who are, have taken these workshops. And um, then I later archive them with those collages, with those, with those images that I've been researching for years. Um, I'm finally at a point where I kind of need a research assistant because it's been like so much of me personally <laughs> working. But these are in collaboration with like librarians who are great scanners and they're so amazing. Um, so I'll, you know, work with these uh, women. Uh, we'll do these private workshops. A lot of them are very vulnerable. A lot of times there's tears or there's some kind of experience of talking about personal trauma. We think about how to move trauma out of the body through movement. I'm not a therapist, but I've been doing more research on somatic um, exercises. I'm thinking about them in relationship to performance art histories and um, histories of um, protests, the theatrics of protests. And um, these collages, I think, are in many ways like the talisman work that I've been doing prior that are informed by Ethiopian art history because they are relics. They are very process based, although they are using popular images and popular archives of liberation movements um, it is really about the process of making these, the, the process of discovering and educating myself on prior civil rights histories and adorning these black and brown women with um, information and affirmations, literally on their head, but also through the workshops. And so uh, bringing in some of that talisman, like signature, like, you know, motifs, the geometric forms, thinking about the gestures of standing, sitting and kneeling and how they've been used um, in protest histories and civil rights movements across the globe by all populations, but also particularly in black liberation movements. Some of these archives are projected on the participants in the form for a video. And from the same body of work, I'm also dealing with oral history, not just written archives. So these are descendants of prominent civil rights activists. On the left, there's Frederick Douglass's descendants, Milani and Ashira Douglas. Um, in the center is uh, Dick Gregory's daughter. And on the right is James Baldwin's sister. And so I'll play a little clip from this video. If we could take a moment and realize and think about all of the times that someone said something to us that carried us through. Mm. Mm. Wow. Mm. And then if we sit in that and accept our power to deliver the same thing oh. to yes. us, yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. we would deliver it more oh. much. Oh. Don't think about like how big it would be. Mm. Our families are who they are on the macro because of all of the people around them that worked on a micro. Come on. Mm. That's mm. the only difference between my great 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 grandfather mm -hmm. and anyone else is that his story got documented mm. in a way that we can share it. Right. But we know mm. how many people stories were just as marvelous, mm. or if not even more marvelous, mm. that maybe mm. weren't documented. That's right. That's true. But he could not have done who he was, and none of our family could do That's true. any part of who they were if any one of those people did not show up and think that what they did was important. Right. That's true. I'm not a murderer, but I will kill before I die. I put a shotgun. I'm not a murderer, but I will kill before I die. I put a shotgun. What you talking about, Master? Feed me good. 
What you talking about, Master did what he could. What you talking about, our works in the house, y'all. What you talking about, what you talking about, boy, what you talking about. You better stop what you're screaming and you're shouting. It's hard to yell with the burrell in your mouth, ain't it? You better find some moss on these trees. What you gonna run and tell? Who you gonna run and snitch? You won't make it to the very next clear, friend, before the bullet in my gun will be whistling. I'll use your blood and your clothes to throw off the scent. Who you think you plan? Who, who you think you plan? Talk about you born a slave and you rat the die one you'll move out my sight i dig your grave son write your name in the dirt kiss you up to the sky you're on my tracks boy you're run or you die cuz i'm not a murderer but i will kill before i die so they it was a day of um singing of they offered poetry they offered one of paula whaley james baldwin's sisters a sculptor and, and stories of the matriarchal women and their family, um, not just the prominent esteemed um, celebrated abolitionists and civil rights leaders, um, descendants, uh, or, or great you know, fathers and great grandfathers and brothers. Um, and so a lot of this exhibition is about the overlooked histories of black women essentially in, in revolutionary movements. Um, I asked the audience, and from, this is a lot of times in my work I, I ask people in the audience participate in a socially gauge experiment. I ask people, what is their everyday re revolution? How can they contribute to social, personal, and global change? And then protest signs have been coming out of that. Um, so I'll leave those in the gallery space. Um, I'll also turn them into buttons and ex give them an exchange for people sharing their thoughts. Also posters, I love giving out like things that like basically swag, things that people like. <laughs> um, I'll probably skip over some of this work, but this is uh, more socially engaged work that's just literally just people taking up space. So partnering a lot of times with um, women of color led um, organizations uh, such as, um, you know, black student unions or um, women of color initiatives. Um, black Lives Matter uh, local chapters and basically giving them in exchange for giving them free space, which is usually my ex exhibition space where they can activate the work um, and bring in their communities um, who are not artists oftentimes and who are not, um, <laughs> who usually don't come into the art world. Uh, you know, then they get to basically, they get free space in exchange. So it's a kind of like a win-win. I try to always think of balance in relationships. Like how can I help people build their, um, their activism work or their community building work? Um, I'll skip over this performance. So the last, I do want to get to like a more of a conversation. So the very last thing that I'll share is as an outro is a three channel that um, I actually started this when I was at SFAI teaching and I completed over three years. So I have like five iterations of it. And um, so in filmed in all four seasons um, and in five different locations around the country. And it's I'll just play it. Home means anywhere I lay my head. Freedom means accessing the world for me. without any inhibitions, without any setbacks, without any restrictions, without any limitations. The place where I go to escape from the world, it's like a nest. A place to regroup. black man in America is to is to be more cognizant of the decisions you make because self-expression is policed more by other black men, black women, other people's 
self-expression could end your life. Just naturally being you seen as a threat. Your body is inherently political. It's inherently aggressive. It's inherently problematic. Being a black man in America is one of the dopest experiences any human being could have. The ability to see, to really see. see what it means to be American. So this was shown again shot in all uh, four seasons. Um, this is actually going to be the subject for um, I have a solo show at NYU in January and their Gallatin galleries. So it's going to be a multi-channel that's hung up. And um, yeah, thinking about everything that is difficult and all the negative images that we consume of black death, but paralleling that with black joy and black arrest, which I think we need to see more of. And that is all from me. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. Oh, we can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Thank you, Alina. <laughs> Thank you. That was, uh, it just blew me away from where I left off watching you and your development and your trajectory. Jesus, wow. And uh, <laughs> a couple of things that I want to just throw by you, particularly that See, I, I couldn't remember all the titles of your projects, but I'll describe them, you know. Uh, I think with the collages, that when it started in 2018, with the, the body and collages and, you know, yeah. that, kind of, that kind of work started going in that direction, I was just, man, uh, you know, that was just incredible, that ten, the, that uh, Rothko, those pieces in the museum, those interventions, yeah. man, us are just really, because there's a, a lot of things that were kind of, I don't know the word familiar, but those images, those, man. And you know, I don't even want to get into like, if you ask permission or if you just lay there on the floor, what the reactions are, because usually people are really interested in that stuff. But uh, I just, for me, that just image and hey, my God, it was incredible. Another thing is, you know, watching you the piece with the ancestors, I think voting outdoors, very recent with the, I don't know if that was salt or what on the ground. Sand, yeah, black sand. Okay. You know, I think that's another conversation that you and I should have privately because I want to let others ask, but uh, it's just, and then mentioning campus, which I forgot. And I think I even I I think I even saw you in Cuba once. Yeah, yeah, we did. Campos, and I just everything came back. And the point is that your movement, your dancing, the body, the vocals, how can how is it possible that it's so similar in Cuba? How is it so possible that this thing just all yeah. over? You know oh, what, yeah. like, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, very. I felt when I was in Cuba, I felt like I was in Ethiopia. <laughs> in fact, people said I looked Cuban, but I'm Ethiopian. <laughs> I felt, I felt very connected. It's you know, it's. Um, I mean, I was watching that, and I, you know, you brought everything Cuban in me, and all these memories, the sounds, the, the body language, the rhythms, and I'm going, how is this possible? Because Ethiopia, you know what? We, you and I know why. Yeah. Because yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. We eat similar foods, we eat similar. Yeah. 
but how they have been preserved mm -hmm. in places like Cuba mm -hmm. and then, or Brazil or things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And then maybe it's a difficult thing to say, but here in the United States, no wonder in that video they're talking about black in America. Mm -hmm. Is that, does that make sense? What do you mean? Like, it's like something happened. Like, uh, I don't see that kind of like long history. Yeah, yeah. Preserved. Yeah. It's, it's still that there. Is. You can't kill culture. No, it no. Adapts, no, no. But, but you, you can't know. kill culture. That's our, that's our soul. And what I was making the point is, and I've just been listening to a lot of lectures about like Foucault and like Hegel and like all these different like philosophers. And, you know, these are people that informed like the likes of Angela Davis. Like a lot of her training was in philosophy, you know, but there's always these pu this push and pull about, you know, is thought more important than culture, <laughs> you know, or is culture and our music and our art and our history and our embodiment, you know, our spirituality, all of those things that we keep with us, that like, was kept through the transatlantic slave trade, you know, and came to Cuba, came to the US, like, is that necessary? I think it survived, it's how we survived as a people. That's how I, that's how I see it. You know, it's medicine and it'll, it'll hold us in this time, yep. the craziness of 2020, the art and the the music and the joy even when i'm out protesting in the streets and a lot of the protests i do with the wide awake movement you know we're all artists singers will bring you know people will bring their their instruments <laughs> and we protest we're in the street you know and it's that energy that joy that um it's that resilience and i've always been attracted to that like um aspect of social change movements because uh you know, it's so important. I think Angela Davis got it in her time, the, you know, in the, in the sixties and the seventies. And I think we're bringing it out now, you know? Yeah. That's why I, I really thank you for all that. It's so refreshing to see your work. And you know, Angela Davis was my teacher. Oh, that's right. She taught at SFAI, right? Yep. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I have the honor to say that. <laughs> yes, amazing. I know in an art school. It was just incredible, incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That lecture hall would get packed and you didn't, even, you didn't even have to be enrolled. It was just packed. People would just came to listen to her. It was incredible. SFA has a great, rich, old history with so many people who came from that school. So I'm, I'm so glad it's continuing in whatever shape or form, I'm glad it's continuing on. Well, thank you for your support. That's why it's so great to have you here in these times. Now, Zaina, Chris, I, I don't want to... Bogart the joint here. <laughs> well, I have a question. Thank you so much, Helena, for for uh, amazing for sharing your work with us. It's amazing to see how how uh, things have changed since uh, yeah since since you left as AI. I wanted to ask you if you could talk more about this new context of the online uh, platform with performance. We started talking about that just. Uh, a little bit before you started your presentation. And I'm curious, um, you know, if you have any thoughts that you can share, you know, about, you know, have you considered doing performance uh, via Zoom? How would that happen? How can you use yeah. that uh, as an advantage perhaps, or how it might not work, or I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's challenging. I actually have a, a Zoom performance scheduled for December, for through Triangle Arts and Syndicate projects. And I've really been wrestling with that because um, I mean, even when I've been performing now, it's been outside, as you see, I've managed to figure out a way to do socially distance work. Um, I have a performance at Friedman Gallery through the Wide Awakes on um, the day after election on November 5th and that's live streamed. So it's gonna be in the gallery, but like with a camera and they're gonna, you know, move around and it's gonna be crazy. So how have I been dealing with it? I get Zoom fatigue, I'll be very honest. I also teach and I'm getting so stressed out by Zoom. Like I give and I give and I give and usually in a live performance you receive and you receive and that's how you're replenished. But I can't get it back through um, through Zoom. So the ones where uh, I'm gonna be doing it where it's live streamed, where I'm kind of in the gallery, there's other people in the gallery so that I'm gonna feed off their energy. And the when it's just me for the camera, um, I mean, I haven't done it yet, but I think I'm going to have to play with that. It's going to have to be renewing because when you perform for video, you get to edit, you know, you get to be in your studio, you know, you get to have this private thing where it's just you and the camera. And that feels good to me. Uh, when it's for live work, again, I feel charged from the audience. 
um, even the uncomfortability charges me. <laughs> you know, I'm like, when people are uncomfortable, I'm like, hmm, okay, let's play with that energy. But with Zoom, I, I don't know, like even giving talks to sometimes online when I give a talk and I don't see the students, sometimes it's a webinar or I don't see the, I don't know how I did or what, you know, if they cared or if they, you know, were doing something else the whole time. So it's really challenging. And I think that people are figuring it out. I really think like, you know, the, these generations of artists that are in school are gonna figure it out really well. It's gonna change and transform art and how we see and consume it and how we make it. And um, I'm excited to see what people are gonna start doing with this information. I'm still, to be honest, figuring it out myself. Yeah, thank you, Helena. I think we're all exploring that. And we, I, I also share your, uh, <laughs> your feeling of the Zoom fatigue. Uh, I, I know it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I feel the same. And it is a challenge, I mean, to think about that and, and how that can change. Uh, but thank you for sharing you know, your thoughts on that. Uh, I guess we're all going to discover along the way and we're going to see how that <laughs> plays out. Um, a year from now, how art is going to change and all of these things with, with the social distance and online platform and this giving and not receiving and all the things that you brought up in your response. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So, Zaina, how do we, uh, can we open it up for whoever else is in this other site for questions? Uh, I don't think it. Uh, I don't think we can do that with a uh, live. Uh, th there wouldn't be a way to do that. I think. Uh, am I correct, Chris? Oh, Kim has a question. Kim, yeah. Hi, that was a, a mind blowing. Thank you so much. I I'm I'm um, really amazed by your generosity and honesty and um, just it, how much that you are working with and how much grace you have at executing it. Um, there was um, one um, part of the, some of the times when the video was playing and you were speaking, I couldn't hear um, what you were saying over it. So um, there was one point during the performance you were doing in the National Museum where um, you said something about, um, it made a lot of people angry or something like that. And I would like to hear a little bit more about that to kind of at least know what you were saying. Um, and maybe I, I think that um, I do performance, but I have around a, a lot of fear around upsetting people and stuff like that. So if you don't mind just telling me how you feel about that kind of, um, that kind of work. Well, if you don't upset somebody, then you're not doing it right. I think I think we should all upset people. Like, I think the most important thing is to not take it personal. Like, you know that if you're being a provocator or an instigator, in which case that piece I was, I was performing that. Um, it's going to make people upset. It's going to make people frustrated. It's going to make people laugh. Maybe they're laughing at the wrong thing, and you you need to you know be okay with that too. Um, you can't control people's responses, but you take responsibility. And so, uh, yeah, people were upset, I think, by the video, mostly. Uh, I definitely felt there were like black women yelling at me, like, why would you allow yourself to be, you know, subjugated in that position for that long? You know, it should always be assertive kind of work. And I was thinking, you know, there's times where, you know, this idea of the spectacle of the black body can, can really, it can infuriate people, you know, there's a lot of politics around that. That's why I made sure that I was resurrecting myself at the end. I think that, um, you know, there was also people who thought it was clever and who thought, you know, it was witty, whatever. Like, I mean, you can't really, I don't think you should care, honestly. I think you should take responsibility, but not care. Because at the end of the day, if they're feeling and talking and thinking, you've done your job. That is your job. Like everything else is like, you know, you know, that's, that's on people. That's people processing their own stuff, you know, <laughs> like, and they're going to respond and react and think about the body because a lot of people have thoughts on the body, whether it's, you know, the, the gendered body, the racialized body, whatever it is, people have their thoughts and they carry their own conditionings and their baggage, but that's not your yeah. That's not your problem. And, and, yeah. And also, you know, the projections that are made onto others' body is also based on their own personal histories, you know? So you can't control that, you know? It's that eschemata kind of thing, you know? They're just gonna project onto you, but it's really projections that they're doing. You're just kind of like, 
a reflection or a receiver of those projections. So I think I think that was a perfect answer. I'm, I'm, I'm in that camp, Kim. It's like, you know, if you're not upsetting somebody, <laughs> you, you're not doing your job. And another thing that my mother used to say, she was such a philosopher. If you just reach one, she would tell me, you did your job, Tony. And I thought that that was amazing. So sometimes I would, a couple of times in performances, I started by giving, I would pick someone in the audience and give him a $20 bill. <laughs> having fun with that idea. And it was kind of, okay, now at least I got one. <laughs> I bought one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and then I stopped doing that because that was really weird. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this, uh, it's a good thing. You know, maybe I, I, I throw it back if it's okay with uh, Helena. Uh, why do you worry? What do I, what do I worry? No, Kim. Oh. Um, it, it, it's not necessarily, um, Just well, it's a combination of things. I think, I think that, um, um, I am the kind of person that is like, I feel what everyone else feels. So I was also interested in, um, Helena, what you were speaking about, how you wait when you're giving to the audience and you're also receiving with them. Um, but I really feel what they're feeling. And a lot of time it is they're right. on what you were talking about them being uncomfortable. And I think a little bit that's um, stifles me um, because I'm instead of, I, I want to learn, I guess, how to work with that better. So that's why I was asking that question. Beautiful. And, I, and thank you both for um, the answers. Cause I, yeah. I really relate to that. So. <laughs> Provoke more. <laughs> Beautiful. So I thought we never got the answer, Zaina. I thought Chris something about highlighting, no? Um, people are free to, to post questions in the chat on YouTube and we can kind of transcribe them here, but, but we haven't received any yet. Okay. I also see Jonah Ar Arnold's in the, in the call. Hi. Hey, <laughs> how's it going? How you doing? <laughs> Good. It was so great to see your, uh, to see all your new work and to see you, everything was amazing. Um, yeah. And I did, I think, um, I'm guessing you already are a fan of Resma Manikem of the, do you know him? He's, yeah. And so I've been really kind of digging into that. And so when I saw your work, it just lined up so beautifully because I think you're talking about the somatic, like the importance of bringing back a somatic experience to um, an art world that like kind of got almost anti-somatic. Um, and and like, I find your work so inspiring as, as far as like being really bold on bringing that somatic aspect back into the works and even like pointing directly at being like, check out this mother well, <laughs> like it's not, you know, and, or, you know, or even like the straight, you know, it was fascinating. And, and the video piece looks amazing. Um, I'm excited to try to see it. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, probably similar to Kim, I'm like, like at points you seem so um, bold and it's really wonderful to see. It's really exciting and it's really, um, it's like impressive, but I agree with her. There's moments of like, how do you know? I, I would also, I mean, I'm obviously too shy to do most performance work. So it, it seems like it would be, I think I agree with Kim that there'd be a tension there of like realizing that you're really pushing people beyond what they're comfortable with. And Tony, I know you're like a professional at that. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's a question of, of like making peace with that, maybe especially as a woman, you know, and as, maybe especially as somebody who is sensitive and who wants to ultimately be comforting to other people in their somatic, like healing and anti-trauma, right? So you're not, you're trying to like help them work through trauma as opposed to like just throw things at them. Um, so it's, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. I'd like to add to your, I love that bold, you know, bold, but mm -hmm. there's also, there's a, like someone said, a grace and a, such poetry, such beauty. And I don't know how, how you do that, you know? And, the, and very provocative and maybe sometimes upsetting, but all of that you managed to just, I don't, you know, it's beautiful, your formal vehicles is what I'm saying. And yeah. you're very aware of how your devices and, you know how to like yeah there's a push but there's also a pull you know the tensions of you may go like that to the viewers but you also bring him back and there's that constant thing 
maybe it comes from you being a painter that push I think the aesthetics the yeah <laughs> I definitely care about material like I, I have performance art friends that came out of a dance background or a theater background I don't have any of those trainings right. so what I have is a training in like objecthood and material and the sculptural yeah so uh, I am definitely interested in aesthetics by drawing people in in terms of like like even having on the last perform you know the first performance I showed with the installation I mean it was an installation that I was activating um but I, I appreciate both of your comments. And um, I think that, you know, I'm also like a human, like everybody else, I get scared. I'm always nervous before everything, like, you know, but at the same time, I think courage is what my work is about. It's about confidence. It's about labor and care, like the care work that women do or people, people do, but I would, I'm focusing on people who identify as women. Um, and how that's been overlooked and under-recognized and how we have to advocate for ourselves and advocate for each other. Like once you've made it, you gotta bring somebody up, <laughs> you know? And that's something that Toni Morrison said before she passed away. It's something that Magda, my professor said is, you know, like when you get your whatever, your platform, whatever, it's not just about you, it's about bringing others. And that's something that I've really uh, take seriously. Like I'm like, okay, so let's, let's all get in. Let's all burn down the house, let's recreate the story. Let's recreate the narrative. And um, I think that's why I'm very much drawn to activism work. I'm, I don't think I'm an activist. I think I'm an artist who's an advocate. I think there is a difference um, because I recognize that my, my work is my art. Um, and I know if some people don't, some artists really call themselves activists, but I think of myself as an organizer of materials, people, places, and things, and conversations. You and, are an activator. An activator. I like that. <laughs> Activator, you, know, you let others activate what you've instigated. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Less work too. And the other thing I'll say about the push and pull is um, reminds me of like I used to take Tai Chi or like Qigong. It's like, you know, you know, you don't force, you don't hit something really hard and use up all your energy. You let somebody else hit really hard and just move away. <laughs> and so, so very similarly, and then they fall and then you get to just you, you know, keep your energy. And so very similar, I think of performance like that, like whoever's in the room, you let them bring up what they're feeling. You don't have to do that much. They're already going through an experience. You're just there to hold space for them, to make them feel that they can feel those things. And I think that's an art form in itself, um, definitely with social practice work and like relationshipy type of performance work. And one more little thing about like being nervous or fear before we perform as a uh, I learned that it's like fire. It's a good thing because you can either cook or get burned. And you have to, but it's a good thing. That means that you care about, about what you're doing. If you weren't nervous and a little afraid and then you're not vulnerable and you're not taking risks is what I think, you know? And you need to welcome failure because that's where we learn the must, you know? And others too. That's the beauty of performance art, you know? It's yeah. like anything can happen. It's not like a tight, rehearsed script. And that's why I think a lot of us, you know, love it because it's a kind of like live, it's like watching a tightrope walker, you know? It's just it's a, a risk, yeah. Yeah, awesome. the beautiful thing and the vulnerability of it. And so it's, uh, you're, you're working while you're entertaining in some ways. Wow. So, you know, I could go on with Helena for a, one more thing, you know, uh, I heard you pronounce your last name. I'm really pronouncing it like a Cuban, aren't I? <laughs> uh, Helena Mataferia. Mataferia. Mataferia, yeah. <laughs> but you don't have to roll the R. You can roll the R, but not everybody can roll the R. So. <laughs> Mataferia, I've heard, that's fine. That's cool. I'm not very, yeah, that's good. Thank you, Zaina. <laughs> so, uh, Zaina, you're the boss. <laughs> No, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, thank you so much, Helena. That was wonderful. I also want to be mindful of the Zoom fatigue that you mentioned earlier, and we're a Friday, so I imagine you've had a long week. I've had, I've had two classes today. <laughs> oh you too, Tony. <laughs> and I have a meeting after this. In 10 minutes, I have a meeting. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I've had already four Zooms too. So yeah, we're not going to complain about it. So this. don't remind me about fatigue. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> if anything, Helena Sok was very refreshing and energizing and inspiring, really. So thank you so much for sharing. It was really beautiful. And we're all looking forward to see how your work is going to develop. And please keep us posted. I, yes. I think to follow uh, John on what you said, uh, Joanna, it's like, man, how did you do, how can you do all this work? <laughs> Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, because there's like an aesthetic and a beauty to some of the work that really follows a formalistic approach that is really spot on. And then at the same time, you're also like smacking people in the face with things. So well, it's, it's well, a beautiful well, combination. We're incredibly produced. We know yeah. that it takes time and labor and collaborating with others and, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call that? Uh, fabrication and working with yeah. others. So yeah. I'm like, what? Well, I'm looking at three years or something, and yeah. <laughs> okay, I better start working harder. Yeah, <laughs> you, sleep, you eat. <laughs> My God, I mean, and I mean that as an. Inc I mean, it's incredible. It blew me away. Just the Thanks. amount of work and the nonstop of it is wow. Inspiring, Zena. More than that, it made me feel bad. I no, better, <laughs> I better get to we work. learn from you, Tony. I <laughs> We all learn from you, so. <laughs> I better get to work, you know? I got to catch up. <laughs> yeah. oh, Thank beautiful. you all for having me. I really appreciate that. It's good to be back at SFAI in this way. And, you know, in a normal world, hopefully we see each other again. <laughs> you know? We will. We will. I promise. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Take Bye. care, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Lena. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Chris, so much for for the tech. <laughs> no problem. Okay.